Gunboat Diplomacy is a variant of the classic board game Diplomacy. In Gunboat Diplomacy, the players may not communicate with messages. Instead, the players may only communicate with their actions, called orders. Since Diplomacy is primarily a game based on alliance making and communication, the added challenge of communicating solely through the orders is an intriguing variation on the classic rules. This guide and my other guides on diplomacy solo wins are intended for a player who is already familiar with the basic rules of diplomacy, such as how the turns work and how to issue orders. I have made this video for a player who has perhaps played gunboat diplomacy before and is seeking to achieve more of these elusive solo wins. If that is your goal, then you have found the right video. I, your bored brother, possess a rare combination of traits. I'm a master of gunboat diplomacy. I love teaching others how to play games. And I have the motivation to publish my teachings in this video. You can read more about me on my website, brotherboard.com. In order to help inexperienced players improve their chances of getting a solo win in gunboat diplomacy games, I have created a series of cheat sheets that offer quick summaries of the strategic goals that are usually necessary to achieve a solo win for each of the seven powers. These cheat sheets are short, they're about one page printed out, and do not discuss tactical minutia such as what order you should take centers or how to form alliances, and they are not about playing for draws. These cheat sheets are simply intended to help a new player understand basic strategic information that is necessary to get a solo win in gunboat diplomacy and I have made a written guide for each of the seven powers. With that background in mind, let me explain some general concepts that underpin all guides for getting solo wins in gunboat diplomacy together with helpful maps to illustrate. First, let's think of the map as divided into two spheres, the north and the south. These two sides are defined as being spaced out between this no man's land, and I'll explain the meaning of the two sides momentarily. But on the quote-unquote northern side of the map, we find Iberia, the French home centers, England, the Low Countries, Germany, Scandinavia, and St. Petersburg. And on the south side of the map, we find the other three Russian home centers, the Turkish home centers, the Balkans neutrals, Austria, Italy, and Tunis. Just looking at the map, and with some tactical experience, we can know that mostly fleets are needed to dominate the north. Most of the centers are accessible by sea or are even best conquered by sea. In fact, only two centers in the north are completely landlocked, Paris and Munich. In contrast to the north, the south mostly is fought over by armies. Looking at the map, we can see that Warsaw, Moscow, Vienna, Budapest, and Serbia are entirely landlocked and can only be fought over by armies. And even the other centers that have some coastal aspects most of those are most easily fought over by armies. The French, English, and German home centers are located entirely in the north, and thus these powers are northern powers. Russia also has a home center located in the north, St. Petersburg, and it is capable of building fleets and contesting the north, so Russia also counts as a northern power. The southern powers are Italy, Austria, and Turkey, because of course all their home centers are located in the south, as well as Russia, since the majority of the Russian home centers are in the south. Of course, you ask, why two spheres? Well, once a power has conquered more than 50% of the centers in one of the two spheres, let's say nine of the 17 centers, it is often easy, relatively speaking, for that power to continue on to conquer the rest of that sphere. However, a player needs 18 supply centers to attain a solo win, 
and there are only 17 centers per sphere. Reaching 18 supply centers requires the power to cross through one sphere into the other. This is relatively much more difficult than attaining the 17 supply centers in a single sphere because there's a no man's land running through the middle of the map. This so-called no man's land is a line of territories running from St. Petersburg on the top right of the map all the way down to the bottom left corner around Mid-Atlantic Ocean in North Africa that contains zero supply centers and is tactically difficult to cross through. Furthermore, defending players hoping to stop the solo win can prevent intrusion into their sphere with as few as 13 units and will likely have several turns to get into position since the attacker, not the defenders, must cross no man's land. Because of this tactical quagmire in crossing the stalemate line, as some players put it, or conversely, the ease with which defending players can rally to prevent a solo win if the stalemate line has not been crossed. Most games of gunboat diplomacy, and virtually all the high-level games, hinge on whether or not a stalemate line is tiny form that protects the sphere of the defending players from the player attempting a solo win. In gunboat diplomacy, forget about the Western Triangle and Eastern Triangle concepts. Some players will insist that the two spheres or triangles in diplomacy are the Western Triangle, England, France, and Germany, and Eastern, Austria, Turkey, and Russia, with Italy straddling the middle and able to participate in either side. That sort of thinking makes sense in classic diplomacy, also called press diplomacy, where the players can speak to each other or communicate in written messages. But thinking this way will only confuse your strategy in gunboat diplomacy, where the players may not communicate in words. With all the authority I can muster as an expert gunboat diplomacy player dispensing my wisdom, I urge you to ignore the advice of players who insist on applying the Western versus Eastern theory in the gunboat diplomacy context. I think those players are mixing up two very different games, classic diplomacy and gumbo. I can elaborate. In press diplomacy, the players are able to organize all sorts of complicated alliance structures, tricky moves, unusual strategies, stalemate lines that are challenged to create. These things are impossible to coordinate in a wordless gumbo game. Gumbo diplomacy is not easier than classic diplomacy, but it is certainly simpler. The non-Russian powers are easily placed into two groups based on their solo win plans. England, France, and Germany all require each other's home centers to win, as you can see on these maps. They have roughly overlapping solo win plans. Turkey, Austria, and Italy, even more so, require each other's home centers to win and have almost completely overlapping solo win plans. Russia is the oddball in gunboat diplomacy. Russia is both a northern and southern power and will require significant conquests on both halves of the map in order to solo win. Do not overlook Russia's role as a northern power, even though Russia has only one home center there. Russia's ability to put fleets in the north from St. Petersburg makes Russia a part of the northern area of the board from the start of every match. Russia has one fleet there to start and can build an additional fleet on the first build in 1901. Typically, Russia remains a northern power unless and until Russia loses control of St. Petersburg. I'm not convinced by players who want to describe Italy as somehow a western or a northern power I mean, sure, Italy can harass France at the start and can reasonably take a few southern French centers with a persistent attack, but to truly morph into a western or northern power, Italy must first destroy France in such a way as to continue onward to attack England and or Germany. Pulling off that strategy in the gunboat rules is extremely difficult and therefore extremely rare. To me, that's just an exception. Italy is a southern power even when the Italian player attempts to ignore Austria and Turkey by heading west. This is because Austria and Turkey cannot reciprocate and ignore Italy. Austria and Turkey are, without exception, 
counting on controlling all three Italian home centers in order to solo win. No other powers, not England, Germany, France, or Russia, require even a single Italian home center to have a viable path to a solo win. Indeed, it's rare or almost impossible for those powers to take Italian home centers in most matches. Because Italy is never fully safe from Austria or Turkey, while either of those two remain viable powers, Italy cannot fully ignore the East, or that is to say the South, and decide to play as a Northern power. In practice, experienced gunboat players understand this. In almost every game of gunboat diplomacy I play, Italy begins by attacking Turkey or Austria, or just remaining neutral for a few years to see what happens. In the rare games that Italy does not do this, one of those rival powers, Austria or Turkey, usually just attacks Italy anyways. For a southern power's victory, usually Munich or Marseille is key. First, let's talk about Munich. Of all the supply centers located in the north, Munich is the easiest to take and hold from the south. This is because a southern power can eventually line up enough armies behind Munich in no man's land as to make Munich very difficult to recapture from the north. Specifically, a southern power can place armies in Tyrolia, Bohemia, and Silesia to support hold Munich. This is not quite an unbreakable stalemate position, but this defense is usually enough to hold Munich. Furthermore, Munich is completely landlocked. Munich's inland position makes that center an obvious target for southern powers, who must build mostly armies in order to first dominate the south, and an obvious weak point for northern powers, who must build many fleets to dominate the north. Northern powers might not possess enough armies to defend or to retake Munich from a horde of southern armies. Next, let's talk about Marseille. Tactically speaking, Marseille is much harder to acquire from the south than Munich. The difficulty is that a northern power can defend Marseille with relative ease against an encroaching southern power. When a southern power sets up a fleet in Gulf of Lyon and another unit in Piedmont, any attack made by those units can be defended by an army at Burgundy or Gascony issuing a support hold on a unit defending Marseille. To overcome such a defense, a southern power must fight a lengthy and tactically difficult battle for control of the spaces west of Marseille, Spain, Mid-Atlantic Ocean, and Portugal. This battle strongly favors the defending players because the area around Mid-Atlantic Ocean is a bottleneck that cannot be outflanked or overpowered by the attacker committing additional units. Furthermore, a southern power is unlikely to possess a large number of fleets and the fleets the southern power possesses are likely not near Mid-Atlantic Ocean. Of all the southern powers, Italy has the strongest ability to take and hold Marseille. Italy's proximity to the center allows Italy to conquer Marseille early in the match without alarming the other players. This proximity also allows Italy to build additional units that can immediately reinforce Italy's westward gains. By contrast, Austria and Turkey start off far away from Marseille. This distance means that Turkey or Austria has usually conquered nearly the entire south well before lining up units for an attack on Marseille. Any alliance of players attempting to block an Austrian or Turkish solo win can easily foresee the attack on Marseille and will line up a, the small number of units needed to form a stalemate position. An Austrian conquest of Marseille is extremely rare because Austria almost always lacks the number of fleets and fleet placements needed to hold that position. Turkey has a bit of a better chance of conquering Marseille because Turkey can build and position fleets more easily, and Turkey sometimes conquers Marseille well before attempting a solo win, if perhaps there is a Turkey-Russia alliance. There are a few other centers that a southern power might seize in order to make the solo win. Occasionally, a southern power can win with Berlin or St. Petersburg. When that happens, it is usually due to some grave tactical error on the part of one or more defending players, or perhaps a player deliberately throwing the game. It's difficult to win with one of those two centers because 
Berlin is so difficult to conquer by land from the south and relatively easy to retake from the north with a fleet in Baltic Sea, and St. Petersburg even more so, which I'll discuss later on. There are a couple other opportunities like maybe Portugal or Spain, but those are also uh, unusual or difficult for southern powers except maybe Italy. For northern victory, Tunis, Warsaw, and maybe Moscow is key. Let's first talk about Tunis. Of all the supply centers located in the south, Tunis is the easiest for France or England to take and hold from the north. This is because France and England can easily afford to send a small number of fleets to capture Tunis, and those two powers always need a large number of fleets anyways, fleets that, in the late part of the game, run out of things to do. Furthermore, southern powers usually build a minimal number of fleets, and are typically reluctant to send those fleets westward until the end of the match. If the southern powers possess too few of fleets, or if those fleets are not positioned near Tunis, a northern power can conquer Tunis and quickly incorporate that center into a defensible position. Let's also talk about Warsaw and Moscow. It is more challenging for France or England to take and hold Warsaw or Moscow. This is because the number of armies needed to permanently control these centers is very high, and northern powers usually build fleets to gain mastery over the north. Nevertheless, it is possible to gain control of Warsaw and or Moscow from the north and incorporate either or both of those centers into a stalemate line. England has the advantage over France in this regard because England can convoy armies into Norway and St. Petersburg that can later march southward toward Moscow. Now, you may have noticed I left out Germany from this part of the conversation. Uh, because Tunis is out of reach for Germany, Germany must instead conquer Warsaw to reach 18 supply centers. Germany has an immense logistical advantage in regards to capturing Warsaw. Germany can suddenly and easily strike at Russia because Germany can build new armies at Munich and Berlin. These German armies are born within a striking distance of Warsaw. There's more also to how Germany is different from France and England. Germany often struggles to completely conquer the north. Germany will typically find that some portion of the Portugal, Spain, Marseille area is beyond Germany's power to conquer by the time German forces reach that part of the map, because they can be easily defended from the south. Therefore, Germany's solo win often depends on penetrating deep into the south, conquering Warsaw and Moscow, sometimes even Vienna or Sevastopol, to offset Germany's inability to conquer Iberia. Finally, don't overlook this critical fact. England, France, and Germany can roll up Scandinavia and St. Petersburg pretty much at their leisure. St. Petersburg cannot be defended from the south against a dedicated northern attack. There are too many territories bordering St. Petersburg to the north. Even if a southern power has an army in Livonia, St. Petersburg, and Moscow, a northern power can inevitably roll that defense back if the northern power commits enough units. For the most part, this also goes for Norway and Sweden, and in some matches even Denmark and Kiel, it is theoretically possible to set up a stalemate line that does hold Scandinavia from the northeast against a southwestern invasion, but that configuration is difficult to pull off in any version of diplomacy and almost never happens in gunbo. I have seen that stalemate line accomplished in gunbo maybe once in my 10-year career. So once a northern power, especially France or England, controls everything in the north aside from Scandinavia and St. Petersburg, that power can usually just grind down control of the rest of those centers anyways, regardless of how spirited the defense is of the defending players. If you found this video interesting or informative and you want to learn more, come to my website at brotherboard.com. There are more materials on gunboat diplomacy and diplomacy in general, as well as my thoughts on games and other things. 
And finally, a word of thanks to my Patreon patrons. It's because of your sponsorship that I felt motivated to take the time to make this video. And with continued sponsorship, I will make more in the future. 